All right, we're about to go rogue from our pattern here. We can no longer fit everything you need to know on this one page. We can fit our summary on here. The how does this happen? We're gonna have to get a new page and we're gonna have to draw it out and talk it through. But the summary, we've already got the electron transport chain results in ATP. Does anybody want to guess how many ATP molecules do you think we get out of the electron transport chain? And I'm going to say this probably as like a, mm, there's a range. There's some variation in how much. And so the number I'm going to give you is like an ish. It's about this much ATP, not exactly, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Um, and that's fine. I'm not going to be concerned about exact numbers, but make sure that you know what your instructor is wanting from you because um, sometimes they give you exact numbers and then they, they want those numbers. I wish you were all here so I could hear what your guesses are. Like, are they super high or are they super low? Do you think like five ATPs are coming out of this thing? 10,000? not a thousand, 28, 28 ATPs, almost three times more than we've gotten anywhere else in the process, two times more our total almost number of ATP that we have generated through the whole other process. 28 ATP are going to come just from the electron transport chain. What are the other things that we've been keeping track of in the whole process? We've been going, where does this happen? We're going to have to draw a picture <laughs> in order to figure out where this whole thing is happening. And then we've been keeping track of the number of enzymes involved. And I'm going to say that there's one enzyme involved and a pile of transporters but you are carriers and you tell me if you agree with that. I, I'm like trying to put it into a box, but you can tell me what you think of that. Okay, so where, where is this happening? Well, oh wait, let's fill this in. We produce no additional electron carriers, but like I said, we got 28 ATP molecules, no carbon dioxide, but go ahead and take a wild guess. What do you think is going to happen with water? We're going to get six water molecules out of this thing. And I'll tell you right now, there's oxygen involved because we haven't seen where we used up the oxygen that we breathed in. We haven't figured out like what happens with the oxygen. Oxygen is super important. Here's where this happens. I'm going to embed proteins in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this is the electron transport chain. Now, I can't see those. And that's like not even close to being big enough for me. So I'm going to have to draw this out much bigger. But that's our location. This intermembrane space is an important part. Now, I'm going to take a little, like, I don't know, a snapshot of this piece of mitochondria, and I'm going to blow it up so that we end up with our outer mitochondrial membrane. Are you cool with that? Which means out here is the cytoplasm of the cell. And I'm going to include the inner mitochondrial membrane, which means this is the intermembrane space, which is a really important place. In that inner mitochondrial membrane, this is where we had those proteins that are embedded. And I'm going to draw them totally diagrammatic, my friends. This is not what they look like. And in fact, I think I might have a picture of what they do look like somewhere around here. Nope. 
I'll have to go find it for you so I don't get, make you dizzy looking for it. I'm also going to go ahead and just move my label, my inner mitochondrial membrane label. Are you cool if I just move it down there so I can draw more stuff? And I'll point to it like that. Because there's one other thing I want to draw. I want to draw our single enzyme. And I'm going to draw our enzyme like this. And there's a reason I'm drawing it like this. Okay, this enzyme. I'll tell you what its name is first. I was trying to figure out like how I'm going to make this story so exciting. It's ATP synthase. ATP synthase is an enzyme embedded in the intermitochondrial membrane. And maybe, take a minute, what do you think ATP synthase is going to do? What is this enzyme going to do? Well, I'll tell you. It takes ADP plus P and it turns them into what do you think? ATP. This is how we get our 28 ATP molecules. ATP synthase embedded in that inner mitochondrial membrane makes it happen, makes it rain. Thank you very much, ATP synthase. From ADP plus P, where did that come from? All the work that you're doing in your cells, all the transporters that need ATP to make stuff happen, they're all using up a molecule of ATP. And what results is ADP and P. And those ADP and P's travel to the ATP synthase, go through the process, and become ATP once again. We're just recycling this stuff because matter can't be destroyed. We're just going to reuse it. We're just going to take the little Lego pieces and make something new because ATP is like gold. So if we can make more of it, good gracious, this is an excellent idea. Let's do that. Okay, who are the players that you would go, wait a minute, how, like what, how is this even possible? Who's providing energy for ATP synthase to do the work of building ATP? Because you know that's going to require energy, right? Right? Of course, because you're going to have to rip the P off of a water molecule and then somehow stick it onto the ADP in order to get like kind of an unstable ATP molecule. So where does the energy come from? Well, we just spent a whole lot of talking time looking at transferring the energy from the glucose molecule into what? Our electron cars, all 12 of them, are going to come. And what do they bring in? They're bringing high energy electrons to the electron transport chain. It's about to get wild because watch what's going to happen. The electron carrier sidles up to protein number one. I don't like where that one is placed. These are not their names. These are not what they look like. And I'm simplifying just so we can grasp this weird entire process. Along come the electron cars, bringing their electrons, their high energy electrons. And they transfer the high energy electrons to the proteins. Now, here's how I envision it. Here's how I imagine what's happening. The electron carriers have high energy electrons. They pass the electron to the first protein. That first protein grabs those electrons. And in that transition, in that passing, there was some energy released. It's almost like those high energy, I, I mean, really, I think of it this way, that we have these high energy electrons that are high, like they have a lot of potential energy. And then we pass them downhill and more energy is released. 
They're not really being passed downhill, but this is just the way that my brain visualizes. Like, how is this possible? It's all electron energy. Awesome. I trust that. But the visual of passing them downhill, I can be like, oh, there's energy there. I see that. Now, what are these proteins going to do with that energy? It has to do with ATP synthase and its function. Might seem weird to start with. They use the energy. <laughs> oh my God, this is so cool. They use the energy to pump hydrogen ions or protons into the intermembrane space. So a question, where does the energy come from to pump hydrogens in hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space it came from the high from the high energy electron carriers. Where did the energy come from that was in the high energy electron carriers? It came from the glucose molecule. Oh, where did the energy in the glucose molecule come from? It came from the sun. That's the next story that we're going to tell in the next lecture. In the meantime, all 12 electron carriers show up to this first proton pro, uh, protein and say, here's some energy. Take these electrons, pass them along. And all they pass them along and they create a hydrogen ion gradient. Now, you will see this also referred to as a proton gradient. And if you think about it, a hydrogen ion, a positively charged hydrogen ion, is the same as a single proton. So either way you wanna say it is fine. Um, I don't know which way I say it more often. I think having the little H there, it, I'm describing it as hydrogen. Um, and I think that for me makes it a little bit easier. So now I've created a high concentration of hydrogen ions inside, a lower concentration of hydrogen ions outside. Do you, are you seeing any hints? Are you like, whoa, wait a minute, we're building into a story. What it, We've created a concentration gradient. And if you were a hydrogen ion and you just got pumped into the intermembrane space with like jillions of other hydrogen ions all around you, what are you going to want to do? You're like, dude, get me out of here. And in fact, guess what your only exit is? Is every topic the best topic in the whole world? Like how amazing is this? The only way out for these hydrogen ions is through ATP synthase. And when they go out, ATP synthase, I'm not exaggerating or joking, there's like a little wheel in here. And they spin the wheel and they leave. And the little wheel inside the ATP synthase, now that's where the energy comes from. The ATP synthase takes the energy, captures the energy in that little spinning wheel that came from those hydrogen ions rolling through there because they want out and uses that energy to, to make ATP. 28 ATPs, as a matter of fact. Now, is anybody anticipating we haven't gotten to an important part of the story? Anybody anticipating a problem here? Well, here's the problem. Those electron carriers can only hold two electrons. I mean, the chain, the, the, electron, the electron carriers can only hold two, but the proteins in the electron transport chain can only hold two electrons at a time. So if we had all of these um, electrons here all these proteins have electrons, just like I visualized here. 
our process backs up, actually. Do you agree with that? Because look, our electron car shows up. It's got, it's like, dude, I got electrons for you. And that first protein is like, somebody take these because I, I, there's more down there. I'd like to get those, but I don't have anybody I can pass them to. Guess what oxygen does? <sighs> take a deep breath and thank your oxygen. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And you, the whole thing would back up all the way to glycolysis if you didn't have oxygen as the final electron acceptor. And if the whole thing backs up, you're not going to get 28 ATP out of this process. Oxygen comes in, accepts those final electrons. Guess what it turns into? True story, it turns into your water molecules. The oxygen collects a couple of electrons, collects a couple of hydrogen ions, puts it all together, and voila, now we have a water molecule. If we go through the whole process, we'll end up with six water molecules. Where is my um, list? Oh, look, there, I already put it in there. That our six water molecules come out of the electron transport chain. Do you feel like, oh, that's perfectly clear. It makes complete sense, of course. It's definitely a story. And in this next um, piece of this lecture, I'm going to go through a little animation visual that I created that's review. If you look at this whole thing and you're like, home kid, I do not need a review right now. I can totally visualize what's going on. I've got the pieces down. I've got the crazy cool diagrams down. I'm ready to go skip the next section, which is the animation review. But if you want a visual review of the whole thing from start to finish, um, that's what we're gonna do next. We're not done. After that review, we're going to look at um, aerobic, like we're going to look at the consequences of not having oxygen. And then we're going to look at some other things that can feed into cellular respiration, not just carbohydrates, not just glucose. We can use proteins and fats as well.